Hi guys, so this is the viruses lecture and in this lecture we're going to talk about virus structure and all the great things about viruses, which is cool because it's really very relevant to what's going on with coronavirus. So just to mention a few viruses because they're not bacteria and we've been talking a lot about bacteria in the class. HIV is a virus and HIV causes AIDS, which basically means you have no immune system. Hepatitis B and other hepatitis viruses affect the liver one way or the other. The Ebola virus is a very fatal virus that can cause severe bleeding and organ failure. Adenovirus causes various things from common cold to pink eyes. A lot of times when people have pink eye, it's a viral infection. That's why you don't do anything. You just let your body or your immune system fight it off. In the influenza virus can cause the flu, as many of you know. The rabies virus, which you can get from an infected animal, causes severe brain and spinal cord inflammation. We're going to talk about bacteriophages. Papillomavirus can cause warts on different parts of the body and it can lead to cancer. Rotavirus causes diarrheal diseases and all the babies get um, immunized against rotavirus because it can be it can be very dangerous for babies to have severe diarrhea. Um, but a lot of times your body can fight it off on its own as well. And then herpes virus, there is different herpes virus that cause different things ranging from cold sores to um, sores or wounds on different parts of your genitalia. And then coronavirus, which is what we're seeing right now, which can cause um, things all the way from common cold-like symptoms to severe lung failure and other issues. So it's, I'm hoping that this is a fun and relevant lecture for you guys, since most of you want to be nurses and go into healthcare. Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about various virus characteristics, so different things that make up viruses what, as they are, the structure of viruses, bacteriophages, which are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. We're going to talk about animal viruses and their replication cycle. We're going to uh, save the pathogenesis and disease-causing animal viruses for when we talk about different types of infections later on in the semester, but we will talk about HIV and coronavirus here because it, there are two good viruses to study how viruses in general replicate in human cells. And then outcomes of viral infections like um, acute infections, latent infections, chronic infections, what these things mean. And we're gonna end with plant viruses and prions. Prions have really nothing to do with viruses. They're just lumped on this lecture because they're also acellular, meaning not cells, and they can be very fatal. So we'll talk about them in the end. Okay, to start off as a definition, so viruses are not alive. They're not bacteria, they're not, um, they're not fungi, they're not any of these things. They're not alive, they're not prokaryotic cells, they're not eukaryotic cells, because anything that's made up of a cell is alive. They're obligate intracellular pathogens. Obligate means, remember, if you're obligated to do something, you have to do something. They live inside living organisms in their cells, so they're intracellular, and they're pathogens because they cause disease. So we say that viruses are obligate intracellular pathogens. A lot of times, textbooks will also define them as acellular infectious particles or agents. Again, when we put A before any word, the prefix, it means not, so not cellular. They're not made up of cells. Um, and they're infectious, and we say particles or agents. It would be a lot easier to say um, acellular organisms, but that would imply that they're alive, which they're not. So they're infectious particles, infectious agents, intracellular pathogens, any of these terms can be used to describe these viruses. And we just mentioned some of these viruses earlier. You can see they cause a lot of infections that range from very mild to very severe, and they're not alive. So how do they do that? And we're gonna learn all about that. So they require living hosts to multiply or replicate or infect. So multiplication, replication, and infection for viruses means the same thing. They need a living host because they need to take advantage of the living host's molecular machinery. Um, they, they're not alive, so they cannot reproduce on their own. They need a living host to do that. They don't have a metabolism, so they use a host's metabolism 
so that they can multiply or replicate or infect. They don't have a nucleus, they don't have cytoplasm, they don't have ribosomes. We're gonna talk about their structure, but they're not a cell because they cannot do any of these things. And usually they hijack the host cell and host cell is a cell they actually infect. So if they infect you, then you are the host. If they infect um, a monkey, then the monkey is a host. If they infect bacteria, then the bacteria is a host and they use their molecular machinery to replicate and make copies of themselves. They're very small, so to add a little bit more to their characteristics, they're very, very, very small. I probably would have added a few varies, but I think you guys get the picture. They're smaller than bacteria. So think how about small bacteria is in lab when we looked at them under the microscope using bright field microscopy. Viruses are even smaller than that. So you cannot use your regular bright field light microscope in lab to look at viruses. I wish we could, but you need a much more fancier microscope with higher resolution. So if anyone remembers, usually bacteria, there's so many different types of bacteria, but they're measured in micrometers or microns. Well, viruses are typically measured in nanometers, which is a thousand times smaller than a micrometer. So they're very, very small and they range from 20 to a thousand nanometers. I don't really care that you guys memorize this number. What I care more about is that, you know, generally bacteria are measured in micrometers and then Viruses are measured in nanometers, which are even smaller. And to give you guys some reference, so a red blood cell is also measured in micrometers, and then bacteria are typically smaller than a red blood cell. And then when we look at viruses, they're a lot smaller than bacteria. So this is a logarithmic scale, and you can see here from small to big. So the smallest is an atom. And then as you get bigger, you can look at, so here are some of viruses. Here's the polio virus, which causes polio, which can cause paralysis. Here's the flu virus, which is a little bit bigger. And then just to give you guys some reference, coronavirus, this here. Coronavirus is around 70 nanometers, the last I read. So in this picture, they're showing you reference to 100 nanometers. Coronavirus right now, which we're having the pandemic with, um, ranges from about 70 to 100 nanometers in size. So it's very, very small. And why I wanted to mention this is you need special face masks to keep viruses out because they're so small. You need face masks that have filters that are super, super tiny that they cannot let anything in. So usually masks are great if you work in healthcare from protecting you from various bacterial infections. But if you really want to be protected against viral infections, you need special masks. So if anyone in the news has been has been hearing specifically with coronavirus that people are using or healthcare workers are using N95 masks. N95 masks are masks that have filters that are supposed to filter out 95% of different types of organisms. And it's because the filters are very small. I forgot the size they are in microns, um, but the last I checked, they're just at that cutoff where they can filter off some viruses, not all viruses. But if, you if you're talking about regular masks that you can purchase from a store, they cannot in no way filter out viruses. There are too big, the little holes in them, so viruses can get in because they're very small. And another special thing about N95 masks is besides the filter, um, I know some of you guys, some of my students, you guys work in healthcare, so you know that you get fitted. So when you are work in a hospital or in healthcare, they fit you properly to make sure it's, there is no opening, not let any viruses in. So the take home message from this slide is that they're very, very small, they're much smaller, smaller than bacteria. And when we look at the structure of viruses, because they're not living, they have a relatively simple structure. And it's really interesting to see how simple they are, yet how infectious they can be. So when we look at viruses, there's the basic things that all viruses have. And then there's more elaborate things that some viruses have come up with. So all viruses, when you look at any virus in the world, it has a protein coat. So the protein coat, which we call a capsid, and inside there's nucleic acid. It's either DNA or RNA. So every virus in the world has a protein coat called the capsid and either has DNA or RNA, which is nucleic acid. Now some viruses additionally to this 
capsid and nucleic acid inside have spikes, which we will talk about. There are these little projections outside the capsid. Um, or they additionally have an envelope and or. An envelope is another extra layer of protection outside the capsid. So again, all viruses have the capsid, the protein coat. Inside of it, they have DNA or RNA. That's why we call some viruses DNA viruses, some viruses RNA viruses. And then some viruses also have spikes or envelopes. We're going to talk about each one of these things. So here is just a simple picture of um, here is a virus here and another virus here. This is the HIV virus. So this virus is a DNA virus. This virus is an RNA virus. So we're going to talk about all these things. Okay, so we're going to start out with nucleic acid. All viruses in the world have either DNA or RNA inside the capsid. As of now, we don't know of any virus that has both DNA or RNA. So they're either DNA viruses or RNA viruses. And DNA and RNA are, we call it the viral genome. So when someone goes out to sequence the virus's genome, they're basically looking at the DNA or the RNA and they're getting the sequence of bases. The viral DNA or RNA has few genes that code for the virus's survival. And this is where they hijack the host system's enzymes so they can make copies of their DNA or RNA. And again, we call this the viral genome, whether it's DNA or RNA. So if you've heard uh, coronavirus is an RNA virus, we're gonna learn all about it in a second. And it's an RNA virus, so when scientists discovered, at least the novel coronavirus, the one that we're seeing a pandemic with, they sequenced the RNA so that they can learn more about what genes it encodes. And the RNA or DNA can be single or double-stranded. This is new to some of you. Um, and they use, the DNA or RNA again uses the metabolic machinery of the host to replicate to make new viral genome and make new viral proteins and the virus itself. But the DNA or the RNA of the virus is really key. This is what differentiates an influenza virus from an HIV virus, for example. Their RNA, they're both RNA viruses. I know that HIV is an RNA virus and influenza is an RNA virus, but you guys all know that HIV causes AIDS, which is very different than influenza, which causes the flu. And the differences are a lot of times based on their RNA. So for one of the viruses, the RNA codes for more pathogenic genes than the other. And then all viruses also have a capsid. So the capsid outside the nucleic acid, it's made up of proteins. We call it a protein coat. And it's there to protect the very valuable nucleic acid of the virus itself. Um, and sometimes the capsid helps attach to host cells. And it determines the shape of the virus. So when we say, for example, a virus is helical, that means that the capsid itself is helical. The protein coats themselves the capsids can have protein spikes or they cannot. So some capsids have protein spikes, some cannot, but all viruses have a capsid and inside of it, they have nucleic acid. And knowing the structure of these things, which we're talking about right now is important. If you wanna create antiviral drugs or if you wanna create vaccines against viruses, you really wanna know their structure, understand it very well so you can create drugs that will target this structure and also potentially um, use these structures to create a vaccine. So here's the capsid and I said that the capsid tells the virus structure, it determines the shape of the virus. Viruses can be structured into three different shapes. So they can be helical, polyhedral, or complex. Helical viruses are exactly what the name says they, when you look at their capsid or their protein coat, it's in a helical shape and inside is the nucleic acid because remember the capsid houses the nucleic acid. Ebola, for example, is a helical virus and Ebola causes can cause organ failure, severe bleeding. It's a very, very bad infection if you get it. Polyhedral viruses, poly means many, have many sides. An example of that is adenovirus. So when we look at adenovirus under a special electron microscope, we see that it's polyhedral, so it has many sides, the meaning that the capsid looks like this. And then everything else that's not helical and polyhedral, we lump into complex. We call it a complex virus. An example of a complex virus is 
bacteriophages. So bacteriophages are phages that infect bacteria and then the pox virus. And I'm not talking about chicken pox here, I'm talking about smallpox. So these have complex shape. And again, all of these refer to the capsid, the protein coat. Another thing that viruses may or may not have is an envelope. So all viruses have nucleic acid and surrounding it is a capsid. Now some viruses in addition have an envelope. So we call viruses that have an envelope, which is outside the capsid, enveloped viruses. And viruses that do not have an envelope, we call them naked viruses. So we lump viruses into two groups. Is it enveloped or is it naked? For example, um, coronavirus, the new novel coronavirus that we're seeing right now is an enveloped virus. So it has an additional layer of protection. And the envelope is made up of a lipid bilayer. And if we were in class, I would ask you guys, where else have you seen a lipid bilayer? And most of you know it's in our own cell membranes. So cell membranes are made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So back to, uh, viruses that have envelopes, they're also made up of a lipid bilayer. And they're taken from the host cell when they leave the host cell. So we're talk, we'll talk about that during the replication cycle. And the benefit for a virus for having an envelope is that it protects the virus. It's another layer of protection and it helps the virus attach to its host cells. Because viruses, to infect any cell, host cell, they actually have to attach. And the envelope may or may not also have spikes. So here's a picture of a naked virus. Remember, a naked virus has no envelope. It's just the capsid and the new nucleic acid. And sometimes, by the way, the nucleic acid and the capsid, we call it the nucleocapsid. So it's these two together, the basic units of the virus. And then if the virus has an extra lipid bilayer, we call that an envelope, an envelope virus, and it comes outside the capsid. And the matrix is just a space, if you guys see this word. So the advantages for having an envelope for the virus, not for us, is that the for the virus, its envelope looks like the host cell's membrane. Therefore, it can easily hide from your immune system. So if you're infected with a virus that has an envelope, an enveloped virus, when it's floating around your system, it looks like your cells a little bit because of the envelope. So your immune system won't necessarily target it for destruction. It won't recognize it as a foreign object. We're gonna learn about your immune system, but the way your immune system keeps you protected is it recognizes foreign material and puts a tag on them that we need to destroy this. Well, if pathogens all of a sudden look like your own cells, it's great for them because they can hide from the immune system. And also having an envelope helps the virus infect new cells by membrane fusion. So if you have your cells that are made up of a cell membrane, human cells, and then you have an enveloped virus, it's easy, easy for them to fuse together if they're both made up of the same material. So this is one way that they can infect two enveloped viruses. A disadvantage for an envelope if you're a virus is they're very fragile. Um, so because they're not made up of lipid bilayer, generally it's easy, it's relatively easy to kill things or target things that have lipids. Lipids are easily destroyed. So think when you have um, oil or grease on your hand that's a lipid. If you wash it really well with soap, you can break apart that lipid. That's the same thing that happens with envelope viruses. And therefore, this is why you can get rid of coronavirus by washing your hands, by using chemicals, because it's an enveloped virus. It's easy to get rid of it off surfaces. Naked viruses are generally tougher. So in a way, we're very fortunate that this coronavirus is enveloped to destroy it with disinfectants and so and then uh, some viruses have spikes. I would say that spikes are probably one of the most important structures of viruses. The spikes are outer surface projections. So if you look at this virus here, these are spikes. They're these little things that are on the outside. And here's the HIV virus. So there are projections coming out of it. They're made up of glycoproteins. Glyco comes from sugar, so they're sugar proteins. So sometimes people just call the spikes glycoproteins, or you'll see someone say GP5 or something like that. So we'll talk about that. And they're very important for viruses to attach to host cells. So these spikes are a lot of times what let the virus attach to your host cells. And different spikes will attach to different host cell receptors. Your cells, your host cells, have different receptors 
on the cell membrane. So for example, if you look at lung cells versus different blood cells, they have different receptors. That's why HIV will infect blood cells because its spikes will go and attach to the receptors on your white blood cells. And that is why coronavirus infects lung cells because its spikes can attach to receptors on your lung cells. So spikes are very important for attachment and they're also a great thing to create an antiviral drug too because if you think about it, if you can stop a virus from attaching to cells, then you can in essence stop the infection. Or maybe you can use this spike to prime your immune system to create antibodies and therefore create a vaccine. So now back to viruses, they can infect all forms of life. They can infect anything living. They can infect bacteria, animals, plants, um, fungi, anything that you can think of that's living, they can infect. And they infect or multiply or replicate by taking over the host cells machinery, by using your ribosomes and using your polymerases and using other enzymes that you have so that they can multiply, replicate, in fact, make copies of themselves. So one new word we're going to learn about here is bacteriophages. Viruses that infect bacteria, we came up with a new term for them. We call them bacteriophages or phages. Everything else is just self-explanatory. So viruses that infect animals, and remember, we're animals. We just say animal viruses. Viruses that infect plants are plant viruses. But we came up for a special term for viruses that infect bacteria, and we call them bacteriophages. So anytime you hear me say bacteriophage or phage, or you hear these terms in your life, they're viruses that infect bacteria. So we're going to talk about bacteriophages first and then get to animal viruses. They're viruses that attack bacteria. Sometimes they're called bacterial eaters, phages. And when we look at bacteriophage, they're DNA viruses. So inside the capsid is a DNA molecule. And this is typically what bacteriophages look like. A lot of times they're drawn as these I think they look like spiders, so this is what they look like. We have the protein coat, the capsid, and inside of it is DNA, and they infect bacteria. So here's a picture of these phages infecting E. coli, so they're viruses. And look, here in this picture, they're causing the E. coli bacteria to die. And the, it's interesting to think about why who cares about viruses that infect bacteria? So viruses that infect bacteria have a big significance in life. And I would say mainly for maintaining a proper amount of bacteria on Earth so that bacteria don't take over Earth. So they're one of the most numerous viruses on Earth. They're very important for the ecology and evolution of bacteria. By ecology, I mean that they, most of the time, bacteriophages kill bacteria. So you get this natural removal of bacteria from Earth, from oceans, rivers, lakes, so that we don't have a big bloom of bacteria. They're important for the evolution of bacteria because one reason why bacteria are so diverse and we have millions and millions of strains and species is because they've gained different genes and they've evolved and they've gained these genes from bacteriophages. And we're going to talk about how you gain genes from bacteriophages. We can use bacteriophages as models for learning more about animal viruses. It's much easier to work with bacteria than animals in lab. So if you want to learn more about an animal virus and its infection and its infection cycle, you can use bacteriophages. Medical reasons, this is very popular right now. So when people have bacterial infections, we typically prescribed antibiotics. And as most of you know, because we've talked about it so much, a lot of our antibiotics are not working anymore because bacteria are developing resistance to them. So one idea is, well, bacteria are developing resistance. And another reason why antibiotics may not be so great is antibiotics also kill all the good bacteria in you. So one medical way that we can use phages is we can use them to target bacterial diseases or bacterial infections and we call this phage therapy so it's a very popular area of research and science right now and if any of you want to do your research presentation on phage therapy you can so now we're going to talk about the infection or reproduction cycle of phages and how they actually um, replicate 
in bacteria. So there's two different cycles for how phages replicate in bacteria. There is the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. Before I get into the details, I want you to remember from the name because I want you guys to try to not memorize things but think about it. Lytic cycle, phages that do the lytic cycle cause bacteria to lyse. That's where their name comes from. And lice means burst. And remember, if a cell bursts or lyses, it dies. So the lytic cycle of phages causes bacteria to die. So these phages cause lysis and death of the host cell. And the host cell here is always bacteria because we're talking about bacteria phages. So what happens with the lytic cycle is you have your bacterial cell, the virus, or the phage will actually enter the cell, use the cell's energy to make copies of itself, and then cause the bacterial cell to lyse. So that's one thing that bacteria phages can do to bacteria. Another cycle of reproduction for these phages is called the lysogenic cycle. And here you see the word gene. And remember, whenever we see the word gene, we think of DNA. This is where the viruses or the phage DNA is incorporated into the bacteria's DNA. So what happens is that you have a bacterial cell, a virus will infect it, it'll inject its DNA, the, the phage, the virus will inject its DNA. That viral DNA will get incorporated into the bacteria's own DNA. And when that happens, the cell will keep, the bacterial cell will keep replicating, making uh, back, uh, viral proteins. And so this is a form of transduction, which we talked about in the genetics lecture. And here's a picture. I think this is a very nice picture showing you. It's an electron microscope picture. Here's a bacteria phage, and here's it infecting a bacterial cell. And by infecting, it's injecting its DNA. Now, that DNA can do two things. It can either cause the cell to lyse, we'll talk, that's the lytic cycle, or that DNA can get incorporated into the bacteria's own DNA, changing the properties of the bacteria. That's the lysogenic cycle. So for the lytic cycle, what happens is the virus attaches to the host cell and it, we say penetration. So penetration is similar to attachment, it's entry. So then the phage um, injects its DNA. Then what happens is the DNA is replicated and transcription and translation happen to create protein and you're creating viral protein. Then we have maturation, which is the viral proteins coming together, the phage proteins coming together to remake the bacteria phage. And then release, it causes the bacterial cell to lyse and new viruses are released. So this is how we could use phages for bacterial, uh, bacterial infection therapy. If someone has, let's say someone has a bad, Actually, a bad lung infection. Maybe someone, this would probably be a very bad infection. They get a bad lung infection from bacteria and you create a phage that targets that specific bacteria that caused the lung infection. Maybe you create a phage that targets Pseudomonas and then by targeting that, the uh, person takes that instead of taking antibiotics for their infection and it causes that bad bacteria to lyse. The really nice thing about phages medically, if you use them, is they're very specific. So if you have, if you create a bacteria phage that targets Pseudomonas bacteria, it will only target Pseudomonas bacteria. So here is a video of the lytic cycle. Bacteria phages or phages are viruses that infect bacteria. This is a T4 phage, which consists of DNA inside a protein coat. The lytic cycle begins when the tail fibers of the phage stick to receptor sites on the surface of a host bacterium, such as E. coli. The phage injects its DNA into the host cell, leaving the empty protein coat outside. The That's DNA of the host right. cell is destroyed, and host cell enzymes and nucleotides are commandeered to replicate the phage DNA, making more phage DNA. The host cell's enzymes and ribosomes transcribe the phage genes and translate them into phage proteins. Phage parts accumulate and assemble to form phages. A phage enzyme digests the bacterial cell wall and the cell ruptures or lyses. As many as 200 phages spill out. Each of them may go on to infect another cell. This diagram summarizes the lytic cycle of bacteriophage T4. So here's the bacteria phage, it's injecting its DNA. 
then the DNA is uses the bacteria's own molecular machinery to replicate itself, transcribe, translate, make more phage, put the phage together, and then cause the bacteria to lyse or die. Now we're going to talk about the lysogenic cycle. So that was the lytic cycle. In the lysogenic cycle, it's very similar in the beginning. So you have a bacteria phage, it attaches to the cell, it injects its DNA, but now what happens is that DNA gets incorporated into the bacteria's own DNA. And when this phage gets incorporated into the host's DNA, we call it a prophage. And so prophage is just phage integrated into the host bacterial chromosome or host's DNA. So then what happens is every time the bacteria goes on to make copies of its own chromosome or own DNA, it also makes copies of the prophage. And this can give the bacteria new properties because all of a sudden it kind of has new genes inserted in its own chromosome. An example of bacteria that have been changed by lysogenic conversion is some E. coli strains create toxins that cause really bad diarrhea. And they've gained the ability to create this toxin through having been infected by phage that changed their DNA. Another area we saw this in is in Vibrio cholera. So Vibrio cholera is a bacteria that causes bad diarrhea and it also causes diarrhea by releasing the specific toxin. This bacteria, Vibrio cholera, gained that ability from being infected by a phage that actually gave it that toxin change. So that's the lysogenic cycle. So they're not causing the bacterial cell to die. They're just incorporating their DNA into their, the, the host's DNA. And the bacteria just keep replicating, keep living, and you can give new properties to the bacteria. So it changes the genetic properties. So here's a good video about the lysogenic cycle. In contrast to the lytic cycle, the lysogenic cycle reproduces the viral genetic material without destroying the host. The lysogenic cycle of phage lambda begins when a phage binds to the surface of a host bacterium. The phage injects its DNA into the host cell, leaving the empty protein coat outside. That's the capsid. The, the viral code. DNA is incorporated into the host cell DNA, where it is called a prophage. Every time the host bacterium reproduces, it replicates the phage DNA along with its own and passes the copies on to daughter cells. Occasionally, the phage DNA exits the bacterial chromosome and initiates a lytic cycle. The viral DNA takes over the metabolic machinery of the host cell to make phage DNA and proteins. The host cell lyses, releasing phages which can infect other cells. This diagram summarizes the lysogenic and lytic cycles of phage lambda. So this was a good um, image because I wanted to tell you guys that the lysogenic cycle can eventually be converted into the lytic cycle. So bacteria can have a phage, phage DNA incorporated into their own DNA, which we call prophage, and they can keep living for life. But maybe at some point in their life, something triggers that phage DNA to cause lysis of the cell to go into the lytic cycle. So you can have viruses that have both lytic and the lysogenic cycle. And then here is an image. So in the lytic cycle, the phage attaches to the host cell and injects its DNA. The, remember, this is the lytic cycle. The phage DNA then uses the host's machinery to make more copies of itself, to make the viruses protein and then once the virus comes together because it's made everything it needed using the bacteria's machinery it causes the cell to lyse releasing all the phage virons by the way i didn't really talk about this but the difference between a virus and a viron is we say virons are virus particles that are not inside cells so like for example on a table you can have virons not viruses but i didn't want to get into the detail of this so this is the lytic cycle. It causes the bacterial cells to lyse. And then with the lysogenic cycle, the same thing happens. So um, bacteria infect, uh, phages infect bacteria. They inject their genetic material, but then that genetic material gets incorporated into the host's genetic material, the bacteria's chromosome. And we call this a prophage when the phage is in the bacteria's chromosome. The bacteria will keep doing cell divisions and eventually this 
could potentially go, go in the lytic cycle if the phage DNA can somehow get triggered in various mechanisms to go back to the lytic cycle. So here's the lytic cycle, here's the lysogenic cycle. And this was it for bacterial viruses. So I'm gonna end this lecture here and do a part two for animal viruses and plant viruses to make it easier for you guys.